This podcast is also sponsored by Kadan Kadan. Kadan Kadan is a new groupage app that allows you to share space within a shipping container so that you can save costs when it comes to your logistics and transportation. Visit kadankadank.com to learn more or visit the Instagram page Kadankadan Official. Good evening and welcome to the Kadan Kadan podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, Ikechuku Kingsley. He is the palm oil guy, and I'm so excited for this episode because I'm very passionate about palm oil. I understand that, you know, Nigeria used to be <clears throat> the largest exporter of palm oil at one point, and now we're not. Um, we're importing palm oil. Um, and I hear a lot about how there's a massive opportunity in the palm oil sector. So we're just going to get to understand what the opportunity is today and what the challenges are and learn about Ikechuku's journey. So Ikechuku, welcome to the to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, Andrew. Thank you very much for inviting me, Andrew. That's okay. That's okay. I'm doing very well. Um, what's what's the name of your company, Ikechuku? Um, it's Kernel Link Resources, but um, we are popularly known by our brand name, the KL Foods Palm Oil. Yes. Nice, nice, nice. And um, where where are you based? Are you based in Nigeria? And what part of Nigeria are you based? Yeah, so we are based in Abia State, southeastern Nigeria. Interesting. Well, like I said in the introduction, um, I'm very interested to learn more about this space. I've, I I want to eventually tap into the palm oil, the, the red oil, as they call it in Nigeria. Um, so t- tell us a little bit about your story. Um, how did you end up getting into palm oil? Um, were you always in the sector? Um, tell us a bit about that. Okay, first, uh, my grandfather was a farmer. Uh, so... I remember fondly as a child, we used to travel to the village and get get our hands dirty with, well, the very crude at the at the time, the very crude methods of uh, processing. So and I I I fell in love with the process, but um, coming into it as a business was out of curiosity. So I I came across. Uh, a a canal processing dump. It had it, it's called a dump, right? Because a lot of people aggregate canal from Bielsa, Oweri, all parts really, and you know, come to process them in Elele. So there's this um huge mountain of canal shells that, you know. So I was I was amazed by the volume of operations that go on there and it changed my perspective of what the industry really looks like. Because at face value, you think that the palm oil industry is just uh, made up of the local people in the village that, you know, wear dirty clothes. And then, so that opened my mind to the opportunities that existed, that exist within the space. And on further exploration, you know, I looked at the challenges with getting into that part of the value chain because, uh, and again, it's also another challenge with, I, I th- uh, let me not jump the gun, we'll get to that in the, as the discussion progresses. So, but basically it was out of curiosity. Then I ventured into kernel production and trading and saw the need to backward integrate because uh, because of the competition for the available scarcely available raw materials, which was the kernel nut at the time. So backward integration was to create a channel for us to have a sustainable sourcing model for uh, kernel operations. Then getting into palm oil came with its own challenges, the type of technology available, the oil recovery uh, efficiency, and the challenges associated with uh, the entire operation. Then it morphed into identifying the gap in the market. And I think that was the eureka moment for me because um, prior to that discovery, I had lost my dad to cancer. And I came upon, I came across a publication about uh, 
the level of adulteration of palm oil in Nigerian market. And so that was pretty much what motivated us to launch the KRFU's palm oil brand to provide a healthier, traceable and affordable choice for particularly the mass market audience. So I think I would have to stop here. Thank you. Wow, that's that's really interesting. So um, you tapped into different parts of the value chain before you ended up with essentially like a, a retail product, a branded palm oil product. And, you know, sorry for your loss. I mean, but sometimes it's those kinds of things that, that happen to us in lives that push us to, to, to come up with new ideas or try things that we've never tried before. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested as well to understand a bit more about, you know, why that particular part of the value chain? Because as a person from looking from the outside in, I'm thinking, look, there's loads of different palm oil brands. Um, so weren't you a bit worried that like your products would get, you know, lost in the mix of all the different, you know, palm oil brands that are out there? Well, thank you for that question because, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it came to mind. And interestingly, I had a mentor I pitched the idea to at just um, without even uh, thinking about the whole idea, told me, oh, guy, you, this, this won't sell. There are lots of palm oil brands in the market. And I asked which segment of the market. So um, that was where he paused and, you know, understood that, okay, maybe I was onto something. So I now explain that our target is the mass market, not modern trade, not any other channel, just the mass market. And why the mass market? The nutrition. And every palm oil brand wants to be in the modern trade channel, right? So because it's the supply, there's supply chain efficiency, everything just it's easier, so to speak. So, but we, uh, I, I like to explore areas I find intriguing and, you know, I let my curiosity lead me. So upon uh, further uh, market uh, survey, we found that, yes, they wanted this retail product, the branded palm oil, but they didn't relate to the value. So we had to backtrack and start from the point of education. So do you know the source of your palm oil today? Do you know that palm oil adulteration is real? Do you know that Sudan 4 in palm oil can cause cancer? You know, all of that education, Start opening people's eyes to, okay, oh, this is real. And then they start looking up themselves. And then the question came, where can we find palm oil? So we did this across our digital uh, platforms and, you know, a lot of interest uh, coming in. And, you know, that was pretty much how, you know, we set up the brand. And uh, I, I like to tell this uh, story of how, you know, we follow the lean model approach to get to where, of course, uh, today our brand is in six cities across Nigeria and has footprints in the diaspora market. Yeah, so, uh, but it started with uh, exhibition at a food fair where we tested the assumption to validate that for real, that people would pay for this value. And of course, we also understand the constraint of selling a product in the mass market because it's there's always this price sensitivity. So there has to be a sweet spot where the price meets the value that you're trying to communicate for you to make sale. So it was a lot of work, but it's been rewarding. Today we have um, distributors across the six cities, like I mentioned, and really it gives us uh, a sense of fulfillment. Thank you. Wow, that's that's really interesting. And you, you covered um, some of the questions I was going to ask because, you know, when you say you're going for the mass market, you assume there's going to be cheap, right? Um, but at the same time, you're talking about giving a quality product. So having that balance between 
price sensitivity and quality is, is not easy to reach. Um, but more, more interestingly, um, you mentioned that you had to sort of educate um, people as, as part of your marketing. Um, can you tell us a bit about what you've learned from that experience? So say, for example, another person is coming with a product, maybe might be new to the market or they need to just educate people. What was successful in that process? So maybe, for example, you, you know, you found that posting on Instagram was successful or going on the radio was successful. Like what, what did you, do you think really helped with that education and getting people interested? Okay, first, people have uh, pain points, right? So I, I feel every business should seek to identify the pain point of the customer and find as many, make sure that your product has enough painkiller attributes to address their pain. So um, we started telling personal, we started listening to personal stories, especially at the exhibition. So um, interestingly, a woman came and said um, she had an experience with bad palm oil. It spoiled the entire pot of soup that she made. So I told her I could relate to the story. And that is what our brand stands to address. So I also said something like, you don't know the woman you bought the stuff from. Even if you knew the shop of the woman you bought it from, she bought it from someone else. Else, so and you can't trace the chain down that line and you know to establish it. But you have a brand, you can trace the source, you have the product information, the contact information of the company. At least that should give you some level of uh assurance that this this brand you know sets out to do what this, they said they want to do. So and it was so from, from agreeing with her personal story to giving her like um, an assurance that this is a brand that has a reputation to protect, sort of, you know, built that, that, uh, that connection for us. And interestingly, uh, early adopters, we had, have been to date our biggest uh, marketers, really. So I will cite a, an example quickly. One of our users in Port Harcourt, one of the users of our product, rather, in Port Harcourt, took, the, took a bottle to, to Joss. So interestingly, uh, the in-law is a major distributor of Okomo oil, the biggest, arguably the biggest palm oil brand in Nigeria. And the, the man is a distributor and he says, and she says, try this other oil, you, you really love it. He tried it, loved it. And then it was a question of, okay, where is this product made? And then we made the first contact and just the first order, the man placed an order for 11,000 units of our product from a customer who only bought to use the product for a personal use, not as, not as a business. So wow. because because it filled the need for her, she felt the need to also reach out to her friends and family and spread the news to them and that's pretty much our growth has been mainly organic and wow. you know and that's how you build a brand just connect to the pains of the customer and make sure your product has enough painkiller attributes to address their their pains and you win the market wow that's really interesting and um, you know i've noticed you've been using a lot of like um let's just say techie terms um, you know, because when, when when I speak to people in the agribusiness space, they don't talk about, you know, building in a lean way. They don't describe customers as users and early adopters. Um, so where, where did you get all this knowledge from? How did you take some of those? I mean, they're not necessarily techie terms, but you don't hear it that yes. much in the agribusiness space. So how did you like get all that information and use it in what you're doing? Okay, first... Um... I'm big on personal development, so I get into uh, spaces where I can learn something new. And fortunately, I belong to a tech ecosystem in the South, South, it's called South South East Angel Network, Sean for short. So um, uh, Startup South is the platform for uh, tech entrepreneurs in the South East and the South South to connect. 
So I belong to that ecosystem. And, you know, you hear lots of these conversations and the rub off on you. And uh, in some of the courses I've taken on both supply chain, you know, of course, because we are growing to become, we, we, we want to become uh, the, the brand of choice in every home in Nigeria. And for, for that to happen, it means we have to build our capacity. And one of the ways that we know we can grow is to make sure that we have that, uh, we sort of build like a digital transformation agenda into our skill, uh, growth plans. So that's basically it. And I use a, a uh, um, I, I think I, I came across a book that has become a Bible and a guiding principle for every business decision I take, um, which is uh, the book. Uh, the title is Lean, I think Lean Startup. Yeah. So I borrowed a lot of uh, nuggets from that book to launch the brand. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I'm very familiar with Lean Startup. Go, go, go ahead. Yeah. So um, that's basically it. So I... I have, that has been like a leverage for me, but and like I said earlier, I'm big on personal development. If it's a new, uh, a new learning opportunity, even if it's outside my space, I want to see how I can connect it to what I do. And, you know, that's it. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, so one more marketing question, and then we'll look more um, wide eagle eye at the value chain, right? Um, when you started off, you said you were educating people, you were marketing, but a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, in the early stages, it takes time to build traction. It takes time to build, get those early adopters. So what, what helped you keep that patience and kept you going when sometimes maybe it felt like, wow, this business is, is, is not easy. You know, I'm not, I'm, maybe I'm not getting as many customers as I would like. What, what helped you get over that? Yeah, basically being in being in um, support groups, ecosystems, accelerator programs where you get to connect with people, you know, helps with these things because you know you're not the only one going through um, tough times. Um, so I am a Fit Foundation alumni, and my alumni members are my set. That that particular set is an annual uh, uh, cohort. So I we have supported each other in low moments and that has really helped. And I've been part of several accelerator programs where I have been fortunate to network with people and you have a challenge, you can, you can connect with someone that, you, you can connect with someone that understands your, your pain point at a level and that has really helped with surviving and nobody builds, nobody survives as an island, you have to build with exactly. community. Yeah. So that's that's very well said. And, um, and one last thing, it also yeah, helps with sales. Yeah, it also helps with sales because your community would eventually become for a product like ours, which is food. So they they'll become your first ad early adopters and help you get the initial traction you need. Wow, wow, well said, well said. Interesting, very interesting. Um I normally do this at the end, but I'd like to just close it off by just um, telling people, you know, where they can find your products. You said you're in different cities. What cities and what um, places people can read, or maybe your Instagram handle, and then we can move on to like the more bigger picture stuff. So tell us a bit about how we can get hold of your stuff. Okay, so in in River State, uh, we have uh, a few outlets. Uh, some of the distributors' informations are on our website, and the website is www.krfoods.com.ng I'll, I'll take it again www.krfoods.com.ng so if you go there you would find and connect with a distributor near you fantastic awesome okay so um i'm really interested now to talk about the palm oil value chain um, for those people that um, are not very well versed in it, uh, can you explain to people like, okay, because you said palm kernel earlier, there's a difference between the palm oil and the palm, palm kernel oil. And, you know, can you talk about um, the different products that can be made from palm oil so that people can just understand what we're talking about? Okay, so um, like I, when I started, I said that uh, 
first impression that people get about palm oil is uh, that man in the village with tattered clothes, you know, not just getting by. But the palm oil value chain is bigger than that. Actually, is the Nigerian market alone is a $500 million annual market. And just to blow your mind, palm oil accounts for over 50% of products you find in shelves in supermarkets globally. I'm not just talking Nigeria. Yes. You say 50% so by 0 or I said 50 50%. Wow. 50%. So just to give you the context, pick up the wrapper of a biscuit. Look when you see vegetable oil, that's palm oil. Lipstick, palm oil. Uh, cream, palm oil. That's pomade, palm oil. Uh, noodles, palm oil. Ice cream, palm oil. Just name it across across several pro FMCG product lines. You'll find palm oil in their formulation. Even seasoning cubes, then cooking oil. So the famous oil, uh, uh, cooking oils that you know today, pa oil, mamado oil, and uh, I think King's Devon. You just look at the, uh, especially King's Devon, you would see clearly written on it, uh, palm oil. Oleum is Greek for oil. So it shows you it's palm-based. Now, to step it down a bit, it's not in that red form. That So it, it goes through further refinement to get to the king's oil that you use. And then several industries that apply it in their value chain, in their own operations, want it in several fractions. So just like crude oil that has the crude all uh, then has uh, several fractions derived from it, the kerosene fuel and the likes. Palm oil is like that too. Interestingly, palm oil has two popular distinct oil types. The red palm oil with a trade name CPO, crude palm oil, or the um, palm kernel oil. They are derived from different parts of the of the palm fruit. The outer shell of the palm fruit contains the palm oil. Then the inner knot, the knot enclosed in, in a shell, when processed, you can derive palm kernel oil from it, which is a very capital intensive business. Then the it has a side product. Now, okay, let me backtrack so that we get it. When you get the palm fruit, you process it into palm oil, red palm oil. You process the nuts into the palm kernel oil. Remember the palm kernel is the byproduct of the production. Same byproduct has a byproduct, which is palm kernel cake and is the primary stock in livestock feed formulation. Call, name it, whether fish feed, poultry feed, pig feed, name it, any livestock. Primary source, the primary ingredient is palm kernel cake. It's called PKC. Then you go up the, the value chain where you have more sophisticated players like the refineries, that gets these uh, crude forms and then refine them into various fractions, like I mentioned, for several industry needs. Even pharmaceuticals use a byproduct from the refineries, which is called uh, palm stearin. The palm stearin is used as a binder in the pharmaceutical industry because it's very rich. It's, uh, it has about 98% free fatty acid content. So at face value, when people want to say, when people say they want to get into the palm oil industry, they want to go into CPO, that's red palm oil production. Whereas there are several other fractions of the value chain they can play. And I, I don't want to also limit the value chain to the processing activities. There's also the, the fruit production, which is the backward integration. And we'll talk about that in great that detail as we go. Then all of these other things I mentioned are 
the processing part of things. There's also the logistics, which is a big opportunity. Moving palm oil commodities from point A to B is that also part of the value chain. There's also the need for um, improvements in the local milling technology. This is also part of the value chain as input suppliers. So I think I've been able to add, speak to several actors across the palm oil value chain and what roles that they play. Thank you. Well, well said, well said. Um, so uh, when, when we're talking now, we're talking about the red oil, right? Because this is the one where most Nigerians are aware of and they see it every day and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. That's the stuff when they say, you know, Nigeria is importing it. We used to be the biggest exporter, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, for example, I'm from the southern part of Nigeria. I'm from Delta State. And I know that it's in Delta State, you can grow palm oil, right? So for someone that's like me that wants to go to their village and grow palm trees and stuff, what do you say to them? Do you say, hey, you know, don't do this. Just try another part of the value chain. If you don't live there, make sure you'll, you know, buy the farm, you live by the farm if you want to grow a farm. Or do you say, you know, what, what advice do you give people that just want to jump in and start their, you know, palm oil farm? Okay, for, first of all, um, there are lots of uh, fake people masquerading as consultants. You need to know their level of competence. First of all, you need to know their level of com competence before you can engage. Then the second thing, you, you have to do your background work very well. Then uh, the second thing is you want to look at the type of funding that would go into the project. Is it uh, money that can wait? If it's not, then you don't want to plant. But I can tell you for a fact that what we need to do is, what we need right now is for more people to get into the backward integration of the palm oil operation, which is the planting. That's because that single line of operation is transgenerational. The palm tree when planted can, so can, has a lifespan of uh, between 30 to 50 years. So it's transgenerational, but requires patient capital. So that's why you see most of the funding that comes, you know, are not tailored to, you know, for funding to, to fund backward integration. But for investors that have access to weight patient capital, I think it's the safest part of the value chain to play. Because when this, the palm starts to fruit, it continues to give you revenue month on month for 30 years. I doubt if there's anything, anything on earth that can guarantee such revenue model. Wow. Not wow, wow. wow, that's that's really that's really um, interesting um, and exciting. And I mean, so but when, when people are planting, you know, I know I've, through this podcast, I've learned that it's very important to do, you know, um, soil testing. Um, and I've heard that with palm oil, you can intercrop with other things. So would you recommend people do intercropping with like ginger and stuff like that? Or do you just recommend just grow the palm oil by itself, keep it simple, uh, and, and, you know, start from there if you wanted to get into the sort of upstream. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it this way, because uh, there's a lot of bias against uh, palm oil production globally. I mean, um, if not for the Ukraine crisis, there was a lot of uh, clamp down on palm oil. There were campaigns, zero palm oil, Palm oil is bad for the earth and all of that. So to position as a sustainable project, you have to think along the lines of um, sustainable agriculture, agroforestry, uh, intercropping. Yes, is one of the one of the ways you can do that. But in the initial stages of the cultivation, you have to allow for them to absorb as much nutrient as they can from the soil right they don't want to compete for nutrients with other crops 
So from five years and above, you can intercrop with any other product, any other crop. But I, from experience, always advise because palm oil requires a lot of nitrogen, boron, and other trace elements, uh, other uh, micronutrients. It's always, I always recommend nitrifying crops like legumes that, you know, add nitrogen to the soil. You know, that helps to, you know, sustain the nutrients of the soil over an extended period of time. So if you are intercropping, you want to put crops that help to, you know, keep the nutrient of the soil alive. So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is a circular economic model, which is what, what we promote, what we, what we advocate for, where all of the solid wastes generated from palm oil production are repurposed as mulch materials to nitrify the soil. Naturally, the palm oil empty fruit bunch that has been stripped of the palm fruits is rich in nitrogen and potassium. So as opposed to using synthetic um, uh, fertilizer to maintain the farm in the long run, you can choose to use the, take back the products to nature. So that sort of like aligns with an ESG plan that presents a business as a sustainable business. And that is one of the, one of the ways to look at it. So I've said all of this to say that when you want to invest in palm oil, you have to think sustainability. You have to think uh, ecosystem-based uh, adaptations that will help you know you to sustain the nutrients of the soil and also to, to make effective use of land spaces. You want to look for the best uh, genetically modified uh, seedlings uh, that can produce in a shorter time frame and give you more fruit yield per hectare. So those are factors to consider in setting up a farm. Interesting, very interesting. Um, okay, another, because uh, we can go we can go super deep into the planting, but I just want to touch on another part of the value chain, which is the trading. Um, I've, okay. I've met one or two people that, you know, they say they buy the palm oil when it's in season, they stock it somewhere, and then when it's off season, they sell it for a higher margin. So. Um, is this also an opportunity for people to look into? Um, it was until, um, so the production of the palm fruit has stagnated. You are, when you drive through uh, the South Basin, South, South and Southeast, you would find large expanse of land with plantations, palm plantations. Unfortunately, those plantations have been left unattended and they have degraded in terms of their efficiency. Nigeria received a funding at about the same time that Malaysia and Indonesia got a World Bank funding to expand palm oil uh, uh, production because it was a primary um, ingredient or a primary raw material in the, I think, the third industrial revolution because it was a major uh, uh, commodity at the time. But look at Nigeria today, sitting at fifth, producing less than 5% of the total global output of palm oil production in, in the world today. So it speaks to the decay. It speaks to the inefficiencies. It speaks to the redundance of those land species. So, for us to look at trading or any other avenue for collective prosperity, we have to look, the way to move forward, like I like to say, the way to move forward with PAM is to go back. Backward integration into the production, backward integration into reconditioning the existing PAM plantations to get them to be uh, effective. Because I go by a mantra that as population explodes, land shrinks in size. So we want to, as much as possible, make available land spaces as optimal as possible. So that is why we have to go back to the books and look at 
the existing palm plantations, how can they be revived? How can they be reconditioned to, to productivity? What is the short to medium term framework to manage that and transition into better yielding uh, you know, species? So all of that will flow into what you just asked. I, I, I deliberately went back to that because it is the only way that we can sustain the trading arm of the palm oil production. So I say that because interestingly, palm oil has, when we talk palm oil, we, we, we only talk of the red palm oil. Palm oil has five tradable commodity instruments. Red palm oil, palm kernel nuts, palm kernel oil, palm kernel cake, palm kernel shell. Palm kernel shell is big business today. It has an export value, right? These are all tradable commodities. But then because the value chain is fragmented, the sourcing, the aggregation, the sorting is, is terrible, to say the least. You find people lose a lot of funds in the process of trying to aggregate this, sourcing through third party agents and all, all of that. So. Trading, yes, is profitable, but a lot of work has to be done. A lot of young people with credibility has, would have to come into this space to do the real work that will facilitate the exchange of trade. Look, for instance, uh, what FX is doing today. FX is the big, is, um, I think um, recently they posted that they are the fastest growing brand in Africa. And they are an agro commodity exchange uh, company. What, 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 look at the instruments they trade. They, they trade staple crops. And they've been able to integrate a lot of smallholder farmers into their supply chain, which has helped to ease transactions, you know, and also help to stabilize prices and all of that. That, that, it, that would take a systemic change for us to achieve the same thing with palm oil. Now, what you have is, okay, if five years ago, when maybe you got into palm oil trading, there were only 100 people stocking up and then selling at the peak price. Today, you have 100x that number trying to do the same thing, right? So everybody is competing for scarcely available raw materials and then it's not available. People are being swindled. Some of them don't have even the right education. They don't know the, how to ascertain the quality of what they buy. It goes rancid in, in storage and they lose money. So all of those things are things that education and awareness can solve. It's not really the crux of the matter. The major challenge is for us to get it right with the back end of the uh, uh, the value chain. Once that is sorted, trust trust me, the, uh, the commodity exchange market is huge. Remember I mentioned that it's a $500 million market, Nigerian market alone. Large corporations are looking for palm oil because the supply chains are fragmented. They are unable to source because of inconsistencies in quality and because largely because 80% of the local production is done by local farmers who lack uh, improved access to improved technologies and access to you know mar uh, wholesale markets so all of these are things that over time will start to come together before we can have a robust palm oil exchange market but i see it happening I see it happening. Wow, wow, wow. That's exciting. Um, but I, I definitely agree with you. And I think that um, a lot more um, investors uh, should look into the space, especially, like you said, if they have patient capital, if they have that money, and if they live in the southern part of Nigeria, because you can get some decent yields over here. Um, so honestly, I, I really want to keep going, but I want to also keep it short and sweet so people can grab as much information as possible and hold on to it. Um, so I guess I'll just go on to the last question of mine, which would be more about um, your part of the value chain, which is the, you know, branded retail products. Um, are there any challenges or are there any areas that other entrepreneurs can tap into? Let's say, for example, distribution or, you know, logistics, like on your side and what could help 
what could help your company sell more into the market? Okay, um, you, you've already answered the question. Distribution logistics are parts of our supply chain that we want to improve on. We've had uh, strategic partners in recent times who you know, have also digitized their business and has sort of given a business like a professional appeal. So uh, we work with ABC Transport. So they now have this tracking thing where a, a, a distributor, a customer who places an order is able to track the, the progress of their, of their goods in transit. You know, and they also have a fantastic uh, insurance policy to guard against, uh, you know, theft and all, any other mishaps on the road. So I think that part, there's still room for improvement. Um, then the area of, uh, you know, distribution, really. So we want to have more distributions come on board because it's, it's profitable. But for the challenges, um, the challenges would be around technology the milling technology to get the best quality available in the market today. We are talking of hundreds of millions of, of Naira. And uh, that's a lot because it's, so you have to weigh that side by side, the size of the farm that we operate today, the direction in terms of scale that we are looking at and how it compares to the decision to get such a, a, um, equipment. So um, we are exploring opportunities for to build synergy between artisan artisans and the academia, where you know we have you know capacity building and knowledge exchange to improve the local technology. I think that's 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 something that will help because we can get these materials cheaper. But and uh, I, I also want to mention that okay, as part of the challenge. Power is a, is, a, is a major one. So, but fortunately, we've been able to address a part of that. So we are a horizontally integrated operation. Uh, we run a horizontally integrated operation. We produce the palm oil, the retail products, the KR Foods palm oil brand. Then we add value to the canal byproducts. So we produce uh, the palm canal oil and palm canal cake. Fortunately, that, that operation is strategically positioned close to the upper power station where there's steady power supply, you know, and that helps us to keep operation, you know, going. So, but for other people coming into the space, if they are not fortunate to get into those uh, areas where they can do that, of course, it has its own limitations as well, because the access to raw material is low. You have to move raw materials from a point to get to where you can process them because there's power supply there. So power is a challenge. And then also access to access to capital to scale because of what I mentioned. So but we have developed a model that is that is regenerative. It has a regenerative regenerative appeal where we identify uh, alien farm plantations, recondition them you know, and just, and that flows into uh, input for uh, operations. So basically the, we are open to partnerships for funding. Uh, and in that, in that area, I want to also quickly mention, and it's verifiable that I always like to say that any investor that wants to come into palm oil should look at it from the lens of the biggest player in the market, which is Okomo. Okomo oil, post a net profit, a net profit of between 30 to 45 percent annually. Net profit. Wow, that's 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 tech, that's tech money. <laughs> that's, wow, that's impressive. You, that's impressive. You, so so you you get the point now. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting commodity. Palm is an interesting commodity. Uh, if you're a person of faith, you'll find so why it's, it's very relevant in, in description of longevity in the Bible, where you find, uh, you say, uh, you will grow age like the palm tree. So it's, it has both longevity, it's, like I said, it's transgenerational, and it has, it's, it's a commodity of multiple values. 
and I was deliberate to leave out all the products that can be derived from the waste, solid and liquid waste products. In more sophisticated palm economies, all of those things are repurposed for additional income that flows into the business. So, in, wow. so yeah, so we're open to partnerships, we're open to collaborations, we're open to uh, investments, but structured investments, not like a crowdfunding. We know what that's, that's the crowdfunding space yeah. is like. To yeah, so <laughs> it's, uh, as Bonaboy said, it don't cast. So, um, <laughs> that uh, yeah so there are lots of scams out there so we don't even want to get involved in all of that so we want we're looking at a structured finance a equity based debt based you know anything that flows along those lines wow thank you so much for that that's been a great uh, introduction for people that are being in palm oil that are new to it um so um, i'm sure people are going to take away a lot of information from this interview um, like you said, your website, it's krfoods.com.ng. Is that right? Yes, yes, please. Perfect, perfect. So thank you so much, Ikechuku, for this um, you know, conversation. It's been very enlightening. I've learned some new things. And I hope the listeners have as well. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. By the way, do you have an Instagram uh, page as well? Yes, we do. It's uh, krfoodsng. Yeah, krfoodsng. Krf Yes, yes, yes. Fantastic. Thank fantastic. you very much for having me. I'm I'm grateful. Same here, same here, same here. Thank you so much and have an enjoyable rest of your evening. Yeah, you too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye.